name is Jacqueline McGlade. Um, I'm actually the UNEP Chief Scientist and I run the Division for Early Warning and Assessment. So my role has, has got multiple elements to it. First of all, we have produced what's called the Emissions Gap Report, which countries have been using because it actually gives the difference between what their contributions through the national elements, what they're already doing in terms of policies, and then what we need to do to put ourselves onto the two degree target. So there's a whole body of evidence that we have put on the table. Then secondly, a role for UNEP, but also all my colleagues as well as myself, is to answer questions, technical questions, and really to look at the consequences of certain decisions, or at least text, that might lead us into different outcomes. And it's important to have as much of the scientific knowledge as possible at the fingertips of the delegations and the negotiators. Are you part of the negotiations as well? Indirectly, questions come to me. Uh, I'm asked about what is the definition of decarbonisation? What do we mean by carbon neutrality? Is the 1.5 degree target achievable? So these are questions that come out of the negotiations and then we assemble either experts or we have the expertise ourselves or I simply answer those questions, yeah. Yeah, let's talk more about uh, these targets because we hear a lot of numbers, uh, 1.5 degrees. Let's start with even our 3.5 degrees if we continue uh, as business as usual. What would happen if we do nothing about climate? If we were to simply relax and take on board the current policies and then let them be taken over by the INDCs, we're only 50% of where we need to be. And so the consequences would be extreme. The 3.5 is a median, and it's a probability, a sort of greater than two-thirds chance, that we will end up at 3.5. Remember, that also means there's a possibility of higher temperatures. And that leads to not only changing weather patterns, a massive change in the ice cap, the melting, the sea level rise that comes from that, but also distribution of species, our food, and the way, in fact, we can live in with cities and, and actually do our normal day job. This would all be disrupted if we were to do nothing today. And according to the INDCs, uh, temperature rise will limit itself to 2.7 degrees Celsius. No, no, that's the difference. So, with the INDCs and current policies, we're actually a little more conservative because we've taken the likelihood of 66% and greater. The 2.7, which has been quoted, uh, looks at the probability of 50%. So there's a 50-50 chance. And what we would prefer, talking to governments and to society, is to go with, well, actually, the two-thirds chance, because, in a sense, you need to build in enhanced early action to even arrive at that. <clears throat> but we need to bridge a gap, and the gap is still significant. It is 11 to 12 gigatons, which is difficult to imagine, but it's doing the same again as we're doing today with INDCs and with our current policies. Okay, so two degrees Celsius is often referred as the safe limit. Yes. Uh, do you consider that also as safe? I think it's safe and I think it's achievable, which is the most important. So just below two degrees is where we're, we're aiming for with these negotiations. And to be very frank, the level of commitments that we're hearing, the engagement with business, with society, as well as with governments, the non-state actors, is impressive and I think it's unprecedented. If we can harness all of those promises, all of those pledges, then certainly the two degrees centigrade pathway is achievable. But we will still need to work hard beyond the 2030 target to make sure that we continue on that pathway because we need to be at what's called carbon neutrality. In other words, balancing the emissions from anthropogenic sources with how much we are sequestering. So we may still need to use what are called negative emission technologies towards the end of this century. And in the UNED post 2015 discussion paper uh, it said uh, respond to successful goals are generally built on scientific consensus about a particular environmental problem. Are you making scientific consensus here in order to reach an agreement? Absolutely. I think this is a, a moment in time when the science is actually all coming together. And yes, we see different uh, manifestations in the oceans where we talk about acidification, movement of species, when we talk about forests and the impact of higher levels of ozone, lack of water, 
and the way in which degradation of land is affecting forests, not just deforestation from human activities, but natural deforestation and degradation. So the story is not only consensus-based, but it is based on the very best that we have, modeling, observations, and analysis. And I think that this is truly an achievement because there are so many different voices, and yet there is this one clarion call of meeting a two-degree target. Do the negotiators acknowledge the science as well? Yes, I think that the time of skepticism is well behind us. Of course, there will still be a few murmurings in certain parts of the world. But generally speaking, I think negotiators are relying now on the scientific evidence, not to take us onto the right pathway, but to give good guidance as to when we need to do more, how we can actually achieve some of the emission reductions that we're after. And what is your main concern right now? I think my main concern is that hubris and um, what I would say hope that a 1.5 degree target is something that comes without additional effort. And that is really the judgment of governments as to how much they want to put behind a lower target. We think that two degrees and just below two degrees is achievable. To take us to the 1.5 degrees will of course not only require negative emission technologies using biomass, using energy, it will radically push the constraints on water availability, on land availability as well. So it opens up a Pandora's box of unknowns and including unknown costs. Nevertheless, we are able to see in one or two scenarios the possibility of a 1.5 degree pathway. Uh, yeah, an, an effort is needed. Um, some negotiators put forward as an argument a lot of statistics. What do you think is the biggest myth in climate statistics? Or is there a I think that many of the myths have been put to one side. We've radically looked at the models that we're using. We've brought more observations in. Um, we have, I think, today we have more statistics that corroborate and reinforce each other than we've ever had. So, for example, when we look at the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization's announcement that the atmosphere has a concentration of carbon dioxide equivalents above 400 parts per million, this is a number that's always been a red line for us. But now we have the observations, now we have the statistics that tell us worldwide this is where we're at. So a lot of the predictions have really become now statistics, have become data and observations. And um, prior to this conference, uh, the UK, yeah, they have cut some subsidies and their fossil fuels have grown up a little. Uh, you criticized them by saying they're giving a weak single price to the conference. Then they reacted, uh, we are absolutely committed to getting a global deal in Paris, which will create a level playing field for this is driving innovation and growing the low carbon economy. Do you believe them in that statement? I can imagine that there are many levers and tools that governments can use. Maybe not all of those are public. My comment was more to do with the fact that having been a leader in renewable energy technology uh, and then creating a situation of uncertainty that industry was effectively closing shop in some instances. And so my remark was very much around this technological, the need for technology transfer and where a country such as the UK was in danger of being overwhelmed or overcome because it wasn't keeping up with that industry at the forefront. Whether or not it can achieve a low carbon economy, I think is to be seen. They are certainly on track in terms of electricity, switching across to clean energy in that side, but we still have some way to go. And this is a message actually for all countries. We still have four years before 2020 kicks off. And that is an incredibly important period because the earlier countries adopt low carbon economy, let's say policies, or a whole uh, series of actions, fiscal instruments and so on, the cheaper it becomes, the more likely and less risk there is, and more crucially, the more consistency we give to, to business to invest. And so it's a really, it's a double dividend. You make it clear where we're going, business will invest, and that will accelerate the change, and therefore make it less costly for all of us. What is your focus of your research right now? Well, in UNEP, we cover pretty much everything. So from energy efficiency all the way through to waste, how we use ecosystems for adaptation, um, looking at how we can help 
communities continue to have food security in light of degradation, climate change losses, disasters and risks. So I would genuinely say that UNEP is universal in the kind of work that it does. But of course we have to deliver on the environmental dimension. And so we do touch on all aspects of that. My own particular area within the kind of UN setting and in the world at large is to make sure that we have observations, data, information from citizens, from governments, from business that really tell us where we are, what we're doing, and how far we have to go. Yeah, so you, you just mentioned that um, you as the chief scientist uh, are involved in the negotiations in a way that you uh, give definitions or explain some, some, some scientific uh, concepts. In what way uh, is UNEP able to, to influence negotiations? I think by not only being present, but by having many flanking uh, reports and activities which are extremely tightly coupled to policy. So UNEP is very much the science policy interface. So we have enormous numbers of experts around the world, thousands, who work on different elements of our work program. And our job really is to translate all of that science into the point where a policymaker can turn around and say, how do you tell me or how can I do this? And then we essentially bridge that gap by saying, these are solutions, or here is the evidence that you need for the argument to put a certain text into the agreement. Could you give us an example for a debated issue where you brought forward some scientific evidence to solve the problem? Well, certainly in adaptation, one of the crucial issues is how to achieve the level of adaptation that we need. And something that UNEP has been promoting very hard is ecosystem-based approaches. Because many people don't understand that ecosystems and their services can actually be a force which is, I'm not saying it's entirely free, but it's something which you can build on the back of using the force and power of nature to make your investments that much more effective. So as a whole sphere of making a difference, ecosystem-based adaptation. Another one is in efficiency. Other areas are in technology, clean technology. And I think generally across the board, you can feel the fingerprints of UNEP's work everywhere through our international resource panel looking at scarcity amongst critical resources, metals and so forth, decoupling, decarbonisation. These are all concepts that have actually come through UNEP's work. Uh, who are you following uh, this conference? In terms of Twitter and well, so no, social well, media? In terms of <laughs> countries? Or, or, uh, well, I think that what's impressive are the African countries. 53 of the 54 submitted INDCs. Uh, the only one was Libya because of obvious reasons. And I think that is an impressive uh, show of not only engagement, but also the power that the countries themselves are really harnessing from citizens all the way through. So I think as a collection of countries, Africa is to be watched. Are they going to make the leap from? Yes. Uh, there is no doubt that with the renewable energy initiatives, with the way in which we're looking at investments, use of water and so forth, uh, tackling desertification, these are all things that the African countries are I would say moving up into the forefront, not only of knowledge, but also uh, implementing, in, uh, implementing policies, but action on the ground. So now we're a whole way to conference. We still have a week to go. Yes. Week to go. Do, are you looking towards a, a fruitful solution, or are you rather pessimistic about it? I'm an eternal optimist. I've always been an optimist. Um, I was asked many times before coming to Paris uh, by people who are very skeptical, oh, it's just going to be another Copenhagen. And I said, no, it's not. The conditions are different. They're entirely different. The engagement of all countries is unprecedented. The fact that it's now, with the Sustainable Development Goals, seen as a universal issue. It's no longer just a few countries. The fact that we can find a way through the differentiation between who has a historical load and a debt and those who are new to the, new to the calculations, and yet we can still find a way to have countries work together. These all lead to, for me, uh, to foresee a very positive outcome. Not just something which is watered down, but something which has got real meat, real teeth. And from my perspective, the most engaging thing is that countries are willing to have a monitoring and review process periodically. That they would encounter some stumbling blocks, that they will find problems, and yet they'll still continue to move forward. Peer-to-peer, -peer, best solutions, this is a totally different kind of COP than we've ever seen, I think. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, you just complimented uh, the African nations on their the work they deliver. Mm -hmm. Do you also think that some nations need to do some catch-up work? Well, in one way or another, every country has to catch up. Even in Europe, there are things which we could have done better, and there are things where there are opportunities that have not been taken up. I think that countries like China, who have really uh, struggled in a way by making a lot of progress, but the, the PR, so to speak, outside has always been not very good in many instances. So I wouldn't say that countries need necessarily to do a lot more, but what we need to understand is what they're doing in the context of actually what will it deliver. So there is a big communication gap between the way that countries are organizing themselves and what the general public, the civil society, really sees. Um, there's a skepticism. Will they do everything they promise? So I would not want to pick out any laggards. Of course, there are some for a variety of reasons. But generally speaking, there are many helping hands this time. So China has reached out, certainly, the South-South cooperation. You can see that um, countries in Latin America are absolutely committed to making sure that their natural resources, their natural capital, becomes part of the positive solution. So all, all together, I would say that every country has its weak and Achilles heel, and we can pick holes in it, but it's much more important that we keep the kind of collective spirit to keep on these pathways towards the low-carbon technology. Okay, well, then, um Final question. According to you, what should be included in the final agreement? What can be missed? What should not be missed yeah. is a clear temperature target. We need to keep that in mind. We should, without doubt, have a monitoring and review process where countries, in a very transparent way, put themselves on the line. And that is seen as a public exercise. It's not just a behind-closed-doors proposal that we need to get over the myth of technology transfer. My challenge to many countries who consistently require technology transfer as part of the agreement is that actually many of the countries have great young entrepreneurs right at home, domestically. And in a sense, we need to give them a kickstart so that they can invent their own things, invent their own ways that are contextual and that actually work for their solutions. So, yes, we do need capacity building. That has to be a very strong feature of this. And uh, it is, for once, we're all in the same boat. So the agreement must have that universality and not contain within it the cracks of differentiation that would drive us apart instead of bringing us together. Because we, we spoke with uh, the Minister of Environment back then in Copenhagen, and she, she had Was the it feeling... Was it Connie? Uh, Jacqueline Kramer. And she was, she was telling us that prior to the conference she was very optimistic. And then 10 days before the conference, All suddenly... Financing wasn't right. And why did that change now? I think because this is a bottom-up process. Yeah. This is a process which has engaged countries from the very beginning. With Copenhagen, we realized that multilateralism won't work in the way that it had. And so this is... This pathway, Lima to here and then to Morocco, handing over. Durban was really the turning point. And I think it's just common sense, prophecy. I think the world has realized it's happening, guys. Five more years of climate change. Well, one of the crucial things that I've been doing is working with parliamentarians and working with judges. Because in the end, what gives confidence to civil society is that they have access to environmental justice that is ethical, that is integrated and really representative and is fair. And what we see now are parliamentarians and, and, and the judicial, the judiciary, really understanding that court adjudications really matter. That if you have good laws and then they're broken and you have a good judiciary that then has very strong court adjudications, you begin to bring the two together and then citizens have confidence in the legislature, and they have confidence then in the judiciary. So our job in UNEP more and more is to bring the two sides together, not to not to blend with each other, but to understand the two sides of it. And I think that's how, apart from our work on the ground with communities, I think that's how we can work with civil society, to give confidence that if there is a problem and someone breaks the law, 
it will actually be addressed. And as I mean, the Pope said when he came to UNEP, the most catastrophic thing that could happen here is if vested interests win out. And that's essentially what we are seeing now, is that they are being kept in the appropriate places and that the legislature is being held accountable and the judiciary is surrounding us. So the ethics, the fairness, it's all got to be in the same picture. Um, I can imagine you have heard of the court case in the Netherlands between yes. Agenda and the Dutch state, which the Dutch state lost. Um, was that was the Dutch state breaking the law? Um, and do you agree that uh, the judge did the right thing, or do you think that the appeal will prove the Dutch state right that the court shouldn't involve into the executive power? Today? It depends if you have a constitution or not, because if in a constitution there is a statement, for example, about climate change, then of course the judiciary is just enacting whether you stayed within the constitutional setting. In the case of the Netherlands, the judgment was correct because they were not adhering to the legal uh, statements and the legislative um, targets that had been set. Now, in other countries, appeals have not been forthcoming. So I think that we're seeing the power of the ju judiciary to take on these very technical kinds of areas. And at the same time, we're seeing the gaps in the legislature to really make sure that they understand that the policies and the targets and the goals and aims really have to line up. How high are the chances that this agreement is actually put into practice? Because, for example, uh, USA has still a way to go after they agreed here in Paris. INDCs represent for all of us a way to track whether countries will implement what they say they're going to do. And I think that this will be the, this will be what we need to see in the next four years. How do countries implement them? There's a lot of unknowns, and we don't have all the policy instruments at our disposal. We haven't really thought about this integration across policies to have real coherence. So there's work to be done by the scientific community, by the economic community, by the social scientists, and so forth. And in the end, by policymakers themselves. But it is the thing that we in the UN and many, many observers and civil society absolutely need to request, demand, and make sure happens that this tracking, this reviewing, seeing if things are really being implemented, will happen. We might speak to Jeffrey Sachs later today. Um, he's talking about these decarbonization pathways. Um, and he calls the INDCs rather modest and short term. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to him? Do you agree with him that we should dive into longer pathways or are we seeing short term solutions with long term disasters? The INDCs are designed to go to 2030 and decarbonization must continue certainly out to mid century and further. And all of our scenarios from UNEP show that when you get to 2030, you still have to do the same again. So it's an iterative process, and I think deep carbon cuts will be required. And, I, and genuinely, we are advising governments, don't leave it till too late, because what you do not want is a knife-edge cliff where you've done a lot, and then suddenly you find that you're looking over a cliff, and you have to cut a great deal in a short period of time. So yes, we need the pathways to be described out to 2050, but given how governments operate, it's only realistic to think of getting ourselves to 2030. But already, we need to have built in the transformation to take us out to 2050. Do you think um, the, the, the new steps are taken at the formal negotiation table, or is it just is it people meeting each other? Because our own Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, made a deal with the Indonesian uh, minister, but that, that happened behind the scenes somewhere uh, when they met each other. The nature of politics is that many things will happen between individual leaders, and that's good if what they're talking about is how to solve climate change. That can only lead to positive outcomes. Um, so we should let politicians do what politicians do best, which is to make deals. What would be great, though, would be for them to set the enabling conditions for everybody else to start making deals, civil society, business, institutions, and I think that's what we look for in this leadership. 
across the world is that the, the target, the vision is set, the enabling conditions are laid out with all the tools possible, with all the instruments, and that actually that opens the door for everybody else to operate in the same space.